Hello and welcome to Bias Exam Prep IAS. As part of a comprehensive news analysis, today we'll be discussing six to seven important articles out of the Hindu newspaper daily edition. But before we begin, good morning to all of you. We have a very important workshop which is coming on 22nd July at 6 p.m. It's an interactive workshop with Sarmat sir about understanding the right strategy for the upcoming examination. You can get a lot of important insights into your preparation and I encourage you to be part of this workshop generally. Thereafter, let's look at the topics we are going to discuss today. Good morning. First, we'll discuss a perpetual issue which you've seen in static for a quite a long time, which is called the concept of universal basic income. And now Rajasthan has introduced a minimum income scheme, which looks like that, quite interesting that way. Thereafter, we'll talk about the issue of nursing colleges, nurses vis-a-vis -vis our population. Then we'll talk about something which is going to is impacting and is going to impact everybody which is tomatoes and why are the prices still quite high and last but not the least there was a NATO summit recently what was the takeaways out of that thereafter we'll move into three smaller topics which are related to the prelims examination something which happened last year but now has started to materialize which is the C-295 aircraft production then the Black Sea initiative which was in the news and last but not the least, the passport index and how have we been performing in it. So, let's start our analysis with the first topic which is the concept of minimum income scheme and the bill which has been introduced, the Rajasthan Minimum Guaranteed Income Bill 2023. Now, as always, I'll give you the basic idea, then we'll go into the nitty gritty and then we will go into the larger summary of what we are doing. Now, very simply, this is a politically motivated concept itself because the elections are coming in Rajasthan. But it introduces a very interesting hybrid model which can be replicated at the national level and gives us a certain understanding of what is called universal basic income. Now, first, let's discuss what is this concept of UBI, which is universal basic income. Now, if you go by the exact definition of universal basic income, it says that it is basically a legally stipulated financial grant which is given to every citizen in the form of certain income. So it is a legally stipulated, it has to be legally by law given to you, it has to be a fiscal grant, it has to be some amount of money which has to be given to a citizen as a form of income However, there are four very important characteristics of what we call as universal basic income. First is it has to be universal, which is that there has to be no condition on you getting this fiscal grant. For example, the government decides that 2000 rupees will be transferred to everybody in a month. Now it has to be universal, universality, which is irrespective of, of whatever your status may be. If you are not employed, unemployed, that's totally on how the scheme is created. That 2000 rupees you have to get. So the first concept is it is universal. So just by being a citizen of India, you get that. Thereafter, unconditionality. That there needs to be no condition on transfer of this 2000 rupees. Thereafter, it has to be periodic. It cannot be like a subsidy which is given at a time of purchase or it is not periodic in the sense it has to be regular. It has to be regularly transferred to you. And last but not the least, it has to be predictable in the sense that it has to be transferred to you at a certain amount of time. So from universal to unconditional to periodic, it has to be given to you except in certain conditions may be stipulated by law. So very simply the basic concept is universal basic income which is been in the news quite a lot now has become static vis-a-vis -a, -vis a legally finan legally transferred financial grant to every citizen universal unconditional periodic and this is a very important concept which has different forms of what we call as good and bad or what we say as there's a debate wherein certain people say that this is very good because in the uh, informal sector the way our employment is in India we need universal basic income but on the other hand the economic logic 
or the economists say that this could distort the market, this could distort the employment market. So we don't have to go into the concept of the debate, but this is the basic concept. Unconditionality is a very important concept, wherein if this 2000 rupees is coming to you, there needs to be no condition. By virtue of being a citizen, you should automatically get that money. So let's look at it. It's a socio-political financial transfer policy or proposal in which all citizens of a given country receive a legally stipulated equally set financial grant by the government. It has to be unconditional. It requires that every person has the right to basic income with virtue of being a citizen and it's part of your liberty. It's part of the concept of what we call as life and liberty that you have the right to have basic income. It has to be universal, has to be given to everybody. It has to be periodic, which is it has to be given on regular intervals. There cannot be a one time grant itself. It has to be given to an individual and unconditional. There has to be no preconditions for the cash transfer. So the first aspect to this whole concept is UBI, which is universal basic income. This is the static portion of this current affairs. This is how you approach something like current affairs and static together. Are we clear with regards to what is UBI, which is universal basic income? Transfer, money transfer, unconditional, universal, periodic to an individual, legally stipulated. Are we clear with regards to this concept? Then I go into what is a specific case of what we call as the Rajasthan bill itself. Are we clear? Yes, perfect. Okay. Now let's talk about the Rajasthan bill. Now the Rajasthan bill is not fully in the concept of UBI, but it's a very good application of that concept. How do we know it's an application of that concept in the sense that very simply it is modifying the concept of UBI to create an employment guarantee scheme. Along with that, it is also adding certain amount of cash transfer to certain section. So let's talk about let's talk about the bill. So what Rajasthan has proposed is that for the first time, both in urban and rural India, this or Rajasthan, this is specific to Rajasthan. Most of the schemes mostly apply to rural. This applies to urban also. Under this scheme in urban and rural Rajasthan, 100 days is guaranteed by M.G. Narega, which you know, which is Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. This gives you 100 days of work irrespective of your status if you want to work to one rural household but now within the employment guarantee scheme of the urban sector which is specific to Rajasthan itself 100 days will be guaranteed to urban dwellers also plus 25 days additional annually will be given as an opportunity to produce more income if you want to work. So basically it has increased the total number of days guaranteed by the MG Narega or the state specific urban employment guarantee act to 125 days. And if you are not given this, if the state fails to do it, you will get unemployment allowance. This is the first concept wherein they have guaranteed 125 days of work to urban and rural dwellers over and above the 100 days which is under the concept of MG Narega. So they've added 25 days. This is for anybody who wants to work. When it comes to old age people, when it comes to differently abled, when it comes to widowed, and single women, they say that they will give them a pension of rupees 1000 as of right now, which will incrementally increase 15% every year. Increase by 15% every year. Therefore, cash transfer is going to happen for the vulnerable section. Employment is guaranteed to the people who can work. This is basically the hybrid model which they've introduced, wherein you have work for the people who can work and you have cash transfer for the people who cannot work or 
are vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis the employment market itself. Now, this is a good concept because this way the against issue, the people who are against UBI, they sit with a lot of peace because this will not distort the market when it comes to work or employment. Because if you can work, it is ready to give you 125 days of work. However, if you are vulnerable, then you go under UBA. And there's already an incremental increase which is inbuilt into the concept. Now, this may be politically motivated. This could be just Rajasthan trying to get votes. But for us, it is a good application of the concept of UBI. One of you are asking me what is the significance? The significance is it gives you a workable model for maybe expanding it beyond Rajasthan to India. Wherein every person for which we will need a lot of capacity, every, every citizen of India has the right to work and is guaranteed work of 125 days for example within certain government schemes if they are unemployed and if they don't get this work guaranteed by the government then you get unemployment allowance but the people or the sections of the society which are extremely vulnerable they get cash transfer which incrementally increases with inflation i think this is a good workable model and on the face value it shows how the two concepts can come together so i leave it to you how you assess it but ubi in principle how it has been applied in the scandinavian countries or it has been applied in europe or switzerland the point is that is quite dangerous in india which is universal basic income ubi cannot be just a cash transfer because then people will not be incentivized to work though in the scandinavian countries in sweden finland there's there's a concept that if you don't find employment within 90 days of getting that you have you will automatically the ubi will stop but in india there can be a lot of different conditions and a very big population we have this is a better model but for that for uh, all india level application you need a lot of employment generation which is a separate issue altogether so before we go into the nitty-gritty what is the basic point here the basic point is you have ubi which is universal basic income not united bank of india please it is universal basic income said thrice now universal basic income universal basic income is a legally transferred financial grant to a citizen universal unconditional periodic to an individual ubi and it is something which has been in the news even the economic survey has talked about it wherein the basic conditions which i gave you was out of that only and thereafter rajasthan had introduced a model wherein urban and rural rajasthan's the, the people who are domiciled in rajasthan they are guaranteed 125 days of work if not given then unemployment allowance plus the people who are vulnerable who cannot work old age disabled widowed and single women they get thousand rupees per month however that is subject to increase annually 15 percent is this basic point clear because this is what you will remember other than that there are other indicators there are separate concepts and separate smaller issues which we have to discuss as we go on is the basic point clear how Rajasthan has modified the concept of UBI to produce what it is today? Yes, perfect, great. So, the government has introduced the Rajasthan Minimum Guaranteed Income Bill 2023. It comes just before the polls. That is why we believe that it is polit politically motivated. However, as I said, the basic point is universal basic income, legally stipulated, equally set fiscal grant or financial grant to the people by the government unconditional universal periodic and has to be to an individual now what is the basic concept the modified concept which rajasthan has introduced is see the technical wording is every adult person residing in rural areas of the state shall be shall have the right to get guaranteed employment for doing permissible work of at least additional 25 days in a fiscal year on completion of maximum days of work prescribed by the union government under MG Narega. Now, the people who are falling in the category of old age, especially abled, widowed and single women, they will get a certain amount of pension which is subject to increase 15% a year. 
Now, very simply, how we interpret it is that it guarantees employment of 125 days every year and 1000 rupees per month to the people who are vulnerable. Now, what is the basic significance or what are the basic principles which are applied? Now, the principles which are applied here are minimum guaranteed income, guaranteed employment and guaranteed social security pension. This is very, very important for you because these guarantees are the new concept which Rajasthan has introduced in our vocabulary. Now, now, what is the minimum guaranteed income? Every adult citizen, 125 days. In urban areas, there is a Rajasthan specific scheme which is called Indra Gandhi Shastri Rozgar Guarantee Yojana. And for the rural sector, you have MG Narega. Thereafter, the right to employment will be in both urban and rural areas with surety that you will be paid weekly or fortnightly and social security for the people who cannot work and that will increase 5% in July and 10% in January from 2024-25. Now this could be a fully politically motivated move because all of this will be applied after the elections but for us the most important concept is how does it create a certain structure which we can replicate. It will also appoint a program officer which will make sure that everybody gets employment within 5 kilometers of where they live and if they are not given employment within 15 days, they are entitled to unemployment allowance on a weekly basis or a fortnightly basis. Now, very simply, just simply, Rajasthan in both urban and rural sector, 125 days of guaranteed work if not, then unemployment allowance and thereafter you have for the vulnerable section or for the vulnerable section, you have rupees 1000 transfer subject to increase 15% annually. Now, this is a very specific thing to Rajasthan. But because you have to appear in GS paper 4, which is ethics paper in which you could, for example, have a case study or they could ask you a broad question on how this model works it is basically bringing in employment generation and guarantee plus UBI concept which is a cash transfer now this is a very important concept for you wherein they are ready to guarantee you certain employment and they are also ready to send a certain amount of money to the people who cannot work. So I hope that you understand this modified concept because this will help you in writing better case studies because this can be a very simple model for you and over and above that you can also understand how this can work at a state level. If we are clear with regards to this, we will move to the next topic because it gives you a very beautiful application of UBI because UBI is a concept which is there in India but has never been applied, right? Okay, perfect. Now, the second topic which we discussed today is related to nurses and nursing colleges. Now, this is again a very interesting article. If you look at the basic paper itself, we did have one article on the editorial on the Indus Valley, uh, Indus Water Treaty itself. However, that was quite projective, quite in a sense, very speculative. That is why I rather chose this topic because it's more substantial to your preparation when it comes to GS paper two and three. And when we choose the topics, we choose them as per relevance to your preparation because not every editorial is important, not every person who's writing is important because there are certain articles which are quite negative in that regard. And this time the Indus Water, the, the articles, editorial articles were quite in the sense skewed in the sense. So I don't want to distort your vision. So rather we are doing the topics which make more sense in your preparation in the larger context. And this is the art of reading a newspaper because what students do is they just close their eyes or open their eyes rather and read everything which is given in the newspaper. You have to pick and choose and that is why we are here to make sure that we take what is most relevant to your preparation. So because there were certain comments which are saying that we've not done this or we've not done that, understand this point very clearly. Not everything in the newspaper is relevant. Whatever is relevant, we are here with and over and above that. The point is editorials are written by people and their 
personal interests. Certain editorials may start as very uh, what we call as optimistic but become pessimistic or very negative and they can give you a certain type of understanding which could then distort your answer writing. So always stay away from certain things which will make your answer extremely negative about the government because you have to become a government servant at the end of the day. You can't be criticizing UPS and then giving the UPS examination. You have to have a balanced approach and therefore that for the balanced approach you read what is necessary, not everything. So I think we all can agree about that and you are with regards to that very very serious aspirant so you would know this aspect of have walking on the fence rather than falling on either side. Okay. So, why have we chosen this topic? See, in India, healthcare sector is extremely under stress and COVID-19 made the healthcare sector also in that regard very, very vulnerable. Now, with regards to the stress which was there on the healthcare sector and COVID-19, what it did, the very simple point is nurses became a very important part of that story. And what we have seen recently is that there's a very skewed way in which nursing colleges and nurses are actually being graduating from India. So 40% of all the districts in India, 40% of districts in India do not have any nursing colleges and 42% of all institutions which do produce nurses are in five southern states. And while 17% are there in western states, 2% are there only in northeastern states. And we'll talk about this data, what you do with it. The point of the matter is, there are certain states in India which do not have nursing colleges. And the ratio, and I'm again going into the larger concept here. The ratio which India has is 0.26 for, or rather 2.06, which is 2 nurses per 1000 population. The universal standard which is there for the world is 1000 population, 3 nurses. This is the standard ratio which it should be. But we are at 2.06 vis-a-vis vis 1000 population. Now in order to improve this, we need to change the way our nursing colleges are placed. 64% now please pay attention don't have to learn this but try to understand this 64% of all colleges nursing colleges which produce nurses are in 8 states out of which 42% are in southern states 17% are in western states and the most dangerous concept is 2% is only in northeastern states which becomes a problem because then either students are traveling to the other states or they do not have access to nursing colleges itself. Now there's a scheme which government has launched that is why we are discussing this topic itself in order to re change the way we see we see the uh, nursing colleges itself. However, that has also been not applied very well. Now before we go into the scheme before we go into all the money which has been allocated try to understand this. The basic point here is there's a major regional disparity when it comes to colleges which produce nurses. Our ratio is not that good and for every thousand population if you have to make increase one nurse we have to basically be graduating close to two to three lakh nurses every year which is not the capacity which is there. When it comes to medical colleges they are growing quite faster than the nursing colleges and Doctors are nothing without nurses and we know that when it comes to caregiving, when it comes to the whole medical system, nurses are very, very important and therefore, therefore nurses and the production of nurses or rather the graduation of nurses in that regard has to be expedited and more than that we have to make sure that every district, at least every cluster of districts has one, one college for sure because that will make sure that the grassroots level healthcare becomes better. So understand this very clearly that very simply there's a skewed concept. It's regional disparity. We need to remove it in order to increase this ratio. This is the basic point which is coming through. So India as of right now has 35 lakh nurses. 
nurse to population ratio is 2.06 to 1000 globally the benchmark is 3 is to 1000 now though there has been an increase of 36 percent when it comes to the institutions and 40 percent increase in the number of seats which are there for nurses it's regionally skewed how 64 percent of them are in eight states 42 percent of the 64 percent are in andhra pradesh karnataka kerala tamil nadu and telangana 17 percent in rajasthan gujarat and maharashtra but the most dangerous concept is two percent in northeastern states which is quite less for the number of population which is there therefore the growth of nursing colleges has lagged behind medical colleges which is 81 percent growth and the number of seats have also lagged behind so very simply nurses have not been prioritized and doctors without nurses are nothing so therefore the graduation process has to be increased and therefore now comes the concept of a scheme which the government of india has introduced the government of india has now expedited or has pushed 157 new nursing colleges in which they are ready to give 10 crore grant for every college in each state itself however though delhi kerala manipur mizoram have benefited from this scheme other states are not using it now as i said what do you do with all this data the simple point is when we talk about doctors we do not need to ignore nurses very very important part of our healthcare sector and when we talk about healthcare nurses play a very important role in the largest perspective now the increase in the seats have lagged behind the increase in seats in doctors further there is regional imbalance and this regional imbalance needs to be managed and for that this scheme is pushing 157 colleges Though the scheme is available to every state, not every state is using it, specifically the northern states itself. And more than that, with the regional imbalance, it only creates issues at the grassroots level. Don't go by the percentages. Just remember, 42% of all colleges are in the southern states. If this is clear to you, then we can move to the third topic, which is tomatoes. Okay, come on. Clear, everyone. The data is not important for the prelims examination. Prelims will never ask you 42%, 64%, no. This is more a mains oriented topic wherein you need to talk about the issues, challenges. This comes as a challenge to our healthcare system wherein it needs to be 1 is to 3000, it is 0 uh, 2.06 is to 1000. So this is where we need to increase. This comes as a challenge. Try to understand, there are certain topics which gives you give you solution which give you challenges this gives you a challenge wherein how can we make our healthcare system better one thing is very clear and you and me know that that after covid 19 there has been a lot of stress nurses have lost their lives over the covid 19 pandemic itself and therefore we need to incentivize and also make sure that we have the requisite amount of nurses in our healthcare sector it's a very important point you need to understand because we tend to talk about doctors everybody wants to give the neat examination everybody wants their child to be a doctor or an engineer but not a nurse and therefore nurses are an important part of the system we need to give them their space within the healthcare sector and also glorify what they're doing because they are the most important part and the cogwheel in the larger healthcare sector okay now we move to tomatoes and something which is impacting all of us every day which is that still the prices are not going down the pro problem is somehow still hovering around that 100 to 120 rupees if you are lucky if you're not lucky it could be close to 150 to 180 rupees now the point is that if you ask the stakeholders very simply the concept is they will say seasonality seasonality wherein somehow somehow 
the tomato or onion or potato which are called top tomatoes onion and potatoes they have a seasonality therefore it's a supply chain issue and if the supply is less automatically the prices will go up if you remember previously we have discussed this concept that every year every year the base price is increasing if you remember last to last week we discussed this concept that it goes from 100 goes to 200 then it does not come back to 100 it comes to 120 then it goes to 220 and it goes to 140 then again it goes to 240 then it comes to 160 therefore there is an increase in base price therefore very simply the base price is increasing which makes sure that we are not coming back to the same base this we discussed previously but this article which is text and context you will not find it in every newspaper but in the Delhi edition itself it talks about the systemic issues it argues that now we need to assess why is that out of the tomato onion and potato sector tomato is so volatile and a very interesting thing which has come through is climate change now people tend to talk about the fact that climate change is something which does not impact everybody on the daily basis or it does not have a cost however this article talks about and very beautifully you can use it for your preparation is that climate change has a cost and now we are paying it for example in tomatoes why because extreme weather events heat waves erratic monsoons floods droughts all of which which have got exaggerated because of climate change now are impacting the supply chain of tomatoes now this is why this article becomes important because for your preparation GS paper 3 this gives you a tangible concept a concept which is applied on the day to day basis a tangible concept of how climate change impacts you and me on a day to day basis understand this point climate change has macro bigger indicators bigger impact but micro impact is for example in tomatoes wherein the extreme weather events are impacting the supply chain itself and therefore the farmers are not able to get what they have what uh, invested which is they're not able to get the commercial cost back and therefore they are either disincentivized they do not want to produce tomatoes or they're selling at one point of time at a very cheap rate where there is a lot of production and at one point of time, there's no production now this is a very important point please try to understand this very clearly that at the end of the day climate change has a cost and you and me are paying it every day and this is a very good example in tomatoes the article gives you a solution also but this is the point i want to emphasize on which is climate change extreme weather events in turn leading to supply chain issues in turn leading to the commercial cost not getting expedited or not getting covered and therefore at one point of time the farmers are producing too much and because of extreme weather events there is a lot of pest infestation which is leading to lower quality of tomatoes sold at a very cheap cost at that point of time tomatoes will become 5 rupees to 20 rupees and once they have sold off their stock then there's no production which in turn leads to surge in prices itself so extreme weather events makes the farmer sell at a very low cost and then because there's no incentive to produce tomatoes it in turn creates the cascading effect of increasing prices when the demand increasing for tomatoes now this solution what is the solution three basic solutions have been pointed out first is we need to integrate the value chain or the supply chain better in the sense when there is too much supply we need to know how to push it into push it into buffer stock or we process it second is cold storages so that we can store for a longer time but the most important concept is as one of you pointed out tomato sauce you wrote 
which is that when there is too much production, we can use the food product uh, processing industry to change that tomato into tomato sauce or any other processed product. And when there is too less, we can push it out of the cold storage itself. So the problem is that the right hand does not know what the left hand is doing. And therefore, the supply chain is fully independent to itself. And that needs to come together. So very simply, this gives you two very important lessons. First, in economics. And second, in what we call as environment. Economics, it shows you how there's this boom bust, boom bust. But more than that, this supply and demand issue. Over and above that, how seasonality is an issue, but that is getting more and more exaggerated because of climate change. Here, economic value of climate change comes through and how climate change, extreme weather events are becoming problematic over the larger perspective and does impact you and me on the grassroot level. Is this clear? If it is clear, then we'll go into the basic points which have been made by the article. I've given you the basic gist of this article, which is the concept of supply chain issue, climate change, seasonality, but over and above that, the three solutions, integration, cold storages, and food processing industry. Perfect. Great. Okay. So, we know that the tomato prices are still hovering around 100 to 200. Reserve Bank of India has now pointed out that it is more systemic and it is related to the overall inflation levels in the country. But, what is more specific is, and this is the more interesting part, how do we produce tomatoes? See, 50% of all the production of tomatoes comes from the following states. Andhra Pradesh, MP, Karnataka, Odisha, Gujarat. Now, there are two basic crops as we know, Kharif and Rabi. In Kharif season also, certain amount of crops are coming, tomatoes are coming into the market and Rabi also. So when Rabi crop will enter in March, August and Kharif will enter in the September. So we are waiting for the Kharif crop to come through. Maybe that will cool down the prices itself. The March to August period, which is the Rabi crop was the one which was impacted the most. And that is why the prices have gone up. Now, there are certain areas in Maharashtra and in Himachal Pradesh, which do produce out of sync. The simple point of the matter is we peaked tomato production in 2019-2020 which is 21.187 million tons. Then it declined to uh, 20.69 million tons and as of right now we are doing 20.62 million tons annually which should be enough but it is technically not enough in that regard. Now how are the prices being fueled or what is the issue? There are two basic issues which are happening. Now, please pay attention. This is where the article is the most important to you. Extreme weather conditions and low commercial realization of crop for farmers, which is that if I'm putting in, for example, 100 rupees, I'm only getting 80 rupees back. This is called commercial realization being less. The input cost is more and the output cost is less or the output is less. Now, how do the extreme weather events are actually con uh, linked to the lower commercial realization? Very simply, heat waves, high temperatures in April and May with delayed monsoons led to pest infestation. Inferior quality came through. Therefore, the farmers sold a very, very low rate. And what has happened is when they sold at a low rate because of pest infestation, now there's no incentive to produce more tomatoes. Now farmers resorted to selling whatever crop they had at these prices and abandoned their crop. And now there is a supply issue. Therefore, the new crop now gets impacted by the rains which are happening because of the monsoon. So very simply, there is heat wave, pest infestation. They sell at a very low cost. Everybody abandons their crop itself. As you would see, they do it on the roads. They do it anywhere and everywhere. And thereafter, supply falls. And once supply will fall, demand remains constant. And therefore, prices will start to go up. Now, the problem here is that the new crop which was going to come through has also been impacted by the monsoonal rains itself. So therefore, one issue, one cycle got impacted by heat waves, the second cycle got impacted by rain. Now this is the irony of the story that in one season our farmers were looking for water and in one season they do not want water and therefore it is the 
way climate change impacts you and me and on a daily day to day basis that it is becoming such a big issue that now we need to have a certain policy in order to make sure that we are using this surplus and deficit in the right way itself. So the NABAD has pointed out that the tomatoes are most volatile when it comes to the three most important agro commodities which is tomato, onion and potatoes and it is because it is more perishable onion and potatoes can survive more heat and moisture tomatoes become very quickly very quickly bad because of the very volatile nature the very peri perishable nature of tomatoes the supply chain issue is also problematic and more than that the vegetable is transported across India so the places where it is being produced the supply is quite far off and there is no cold storage in between so if there is any block what we call as bottleneck in the supply chain the tomatoes will go bad automatically so how do we make this better first is it is highly perishable therefore improve value and supply chains we have to make sure that it is market focused production process and market product and service everything needs to be effective more integrated cold chains and cold storages and more than that we need to use processing units linked to tomatoes in a better way so that when there's too much peak production is there we can process it and give the farmer certain incentives to produce now before we move on to the last article let me summarize this article for you everybody's followed me till this point i'll try to give you the simplest possible explanation and summary of this area Yes? Okay. Now, what is the concept? Tomatoes are expensive. Every crop is seasonal. However, what is the way it has become problematic? See, heat waves came. That led to pest infestation. That in turn led to the tomato crop being very, very bad. So the farmers sold at a very low price and when they sell at a very low price, there is no incentive to produce more. Now, supply falls, demand still remains the same, price starts to increase. Now, this heat wave is because of climate change and the new crop is also getting impacted due to climate change. Now very simply, anybody can say anything that it's seasonal, this and that, we need cold storage. You tell me what is the major issue here. The systemic issue to top or what we call as tomato, onion and potato is what? What is the systemic issue? If you will tell me the right answer, we'll move to the next option or the next article itself. The systemic issue in this whole issue is what? What is the most important factor in everything? What is the most important factor? Very good. Climate variation. Not perishability. Gordhan has pointed out right. Climate variation. Climate. Very good. Very good. It is climate change. Now, this is a workable example of telling you how climate change impacts your life on a day-to-day -day basis. So, therefore, price volatility may be based on economic factors. But the problem is not cold storage. It is not, as of right now, the concept of tomato production. It is climate change. It is making the rabi and the kharif crop so unpredictable that in turn it is leading to cascading economic issues. Clear? Everyone? Buffer stock and all are effect, not cause. Here the cause is climate change. Are you able to understand the basic theoretical understanding which needs to come out of this article? Data is not always relevant for you. What is more important is the systemic issue. Because now when you write an answer for environment, for essay, you can always talk about how there is an economic cost. This is something which nobody talks about, which is the economic cost of climate change. We think that a nation will pay it. No, you and me are paying it. Because we've stopped eating tomatoes. 
at the end of the day will eat at 100 to 120 rupees per kg and the simple point of the matter is this is the problem that we tend to see in compartments or what we call compartmentalization of issues this is much bigger and much more integrated into our economy perfect so let's move to the next topic NATO now we know the North Atlantic Treaty Organization NATO if you want a basic summary of how it came through after the Berlin blockade in 1948 after the second world war itself when Stalin wanted to take East Berlin and West Berlin rather West Berlin and integrate Berlin itself the Berlin blockade in turn led to a frustration of Stalin because of the Berlin airlift and everything was airlifted to West Berlin and therefore Stalin got frustrated and when Stalin did get frustrated between 1945 to 1949 US and Oppenheimer movies also going to come in the movies very or in the theaters very soon which is based on the Manhattan project itself the when when the nuclear bomb was actually uh, tested by the US it was the only nation to have the nuclear bomb and for the first four years between 1945 to 49 it was the only nation but in 1949 when the USSR for the first time detonated its first nuclear test or first nuclear bomb it created a panic in the Western Bloc and that in turn created what is called the Brussels Defense Treaty and in turn produced when US and Canada joined it, it became what is called as the NATO. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO has two basic principles which is joint command. Everybody has to contribute to the army itself and the army, air force and the navy. And it is called the concept of collective security. Collective security is that if you attack one NATO member, you are attacking everybody. Now, NATO, one of the biggest issues it has had is the membership of what we call as Ukraine. Now, Ukraine for a very long time has been asking for NATO membership has a border with the old adversary or the old enemy of the West which is Russia and in 2014 Russia did address rehearsal it checked how much does the NATO care about Ukraine by taking the what we call as Crimean Peninsula for the Sevastopol port itself and thereafter as we know in 2020-21 uh, late 2021 they planned this larger concept of the Ukrainian uh, takeover or the annexation of Ukraine which manifested itself last year and is now perpetuating. Now very simply the Ukrainian takeover or the annexation of Ukraine is Russia's way of saying that if you don't care about Ukraine we'll take it because we want the oil we want the natural resources and recently this was in the news because of the Wagner group which is the private mercenary group which was fighting for Putin and because NATO though has not given full membership to Ukraine what Ukraine is getting right now is a lot of arms and ammunition from the NATO and this is the win-win situation the friends with benefit concept wherein NATO as of right now is providing a lot of arms and ammunition to Ukraine and in return to that the NATO is getting to know how would their or how would their weapons perform in front of Russian weaponry for example recently the javelin and the Stingray missiles were able to take down certain fighter jets which should not, fighter jet and tank, which should not have been actually impacted by that missile. So the US got to know, okay, we can use this type of weapon against the, against the Russian army. So NATO members are getting to know, okay, how does our basic weaponry work in the real world situation? And Ukraine, everything is God-given, prasadam, everything is given to them. They are taking whatever they want. So they have asked initially for what we call as anti-tank missiles. Now they're asking for anti-ballistic missiles. Now, as of right now, Ukraine wants F-16s and F-18 Hornet. They're saying, give us fighter jets also. You've given us Leopard tank, you've given us Abraham tanks, you've given us the tanks, very good, that has allowed us to push them back. So basically, US, as much as it spends on its defense, cannot survive without a war. And with the Middle East already destabilized and no real war there, 
vis-a-vis -vis Syria already destabilized, Oman and uh, the whole sector destabilized, they needed a new war. And this has now become a very beautiful relationship between NATO and Ukraine. So the summit was seen as something very, very significant because Zelensky, which is Ukrainian president, who he went there with certain demands that we want this, we want that, we want certain things. Ironically, at the end of the day, NATO is made out of Western European countries who are nothing but hypocritical. They will do what they want to do and not give you what you want. So very simply, he did not get anything. He actually did not get anything. Rather than just a concept of NATO-Ukraine summit or council which will take joint decisions. What was more important was that last to last year when it happened, it, Trump had a very negative outlook towards NATO. However, Biden has been extremely positive about NATO that I am ready to fund the NATO we are, and US being a very important funder of the NATO itself. So the basic impact is mixed in the sense nothing really came out, which is standard process when it comes to what we call as the Western countries. They will give you what you want, but they will not or rather they'll give you what they want and they will just play around with the concept. So very simply, there are certain issues which we need to discuss vis-a-vis -vis the nitty-gritty of the summit itself. But I'm, what I'm trying to give you is a larger perspective about NATO and this drama called the NATO summit. So the NATO summit recently happened and there were a lot of takeaways out of it. But I hope that you understand the hollowness of the NATO and now this new concern which they have about Ukraine is all circumstantial. Nobody really cared about Ukraine for a very, very long time. Only when it became Russia versus Ukraine, then it has become a very big issue. And more than that, if it was not such a big conflict in which their tanks and their equipment could have been checked, they would not have been interested only. If they were so concerned about Ukraine, Ukraine has been asking for membership for quite a long time. If Finland can join and if Sweden is going to be is, is, is entering with ratification with different NATO members itself pending, the point is Ukraine could have been added. And still, Ukraine is saying, add us. But Ukraine, if you add to NATO, then Russia is not fighting Ukraine. Russia is fighting every NATO country, which no NATO country wants. And therefore, Russia, Ukraine always was a buffer state. And once Russia said, okay, let me remove the buffer and the concept of the Iron Curtain again moving towards the West, there is a panic in the West itself. Russia has already proved that the sanctions don't work. India has already taken a very good stance in this, which is that our interest is more important than NATO interest itself. And NATO is only using the Ukraine conflict to fund its basic defense ministries and defense, basic defense industries. Clear? If that is clear, we'll go into the smaller issues. Great. Perfect. Okay. So, what was the standout moment? President Zelensky anticipated NATO's membership to Ukraine, not given, zero. Thereafter, launch of a NATO-Ukraine Council for better alliance, engagement, support and future inclusion as a full member. This is the lollipop which was given to Ukraine. Right now, let's have a council. Maybe this will become membership. So this is the lollipop given to Zelensky. He wanted three basic guarantees. And the three guarantees was, we, I want new weapons package, not given to him. Security guarantees, not given to him. Invitation to join NATO, not given to him. UK said, we will help you with ammunition, but yes, we are not ready to give you right now. Whatever we are giving you right now, enjoy it, use it. When we think you need an F-16, we'll give an F-16. The point of the matter is, everything which Ukraine wanted was not given to it. Whatever the NATO wanted to show to the world that we are supporting Ukraine, they did it. That is the basic point here. Now, what is the overall picture of this summit? Biden has a totally different approach when it comes to NATO. Trump used to see it as a, what we call as a futile expenditure. He said, no, I will fund the NATO. No issues. Thereafter, NATO said that China is the problem for all of us, which is their cyber attacks are actually disrupting a lot of our economies. And therefore, very simply, it is a threat to us. Nothing new again. Everybody knows that China is a problem. And the more significant thing which came out of this for India, and that is why we're discussing this topic, is that they want the quad to be expanded to add New Zealand and South Korea. 
they are arguing that quad should now include new zealand already has australia now new zealand and south korea japan is already there now again all is projective what is going to happen you add new zealand and south korea indo pacific still will be dominated if you don't take india seriously indo pacific is not clear for you and china is the adversary china is aggressive in that regard now what is the key takeaway out of all of this before we go to the prelims bite section very simply very simply nato is a drama we already know that it is based on the concept of collective collective security but very selective security it is selective collective security of the countries which matter for the countries which matter because at the end of the day ukraine has been asking for it and if they were actually very serious they would have added ukraine to the to the nato the simple point of the matter was ukraine was always a buffer between nato and russia and therefore once russia forced the issue that became a problem for nato generally now very simply this is going out of hand now it's been quite a long time and the only reason ukraine is surviving is because of nato support so the nato is ready to support they are ready to support the government the way we have it in coalition politics from outside but not become a coalition partner itself the same way nato is ready to support because the more they give to the ukraine the ukraine ukraine will have to pay back all the debt it has taken and all the equipment which was randomly lying around and most of the equipment has a date of expiry now they are using it in the ukraine battle itself and ukraine has an upper hand upper hand because of that only at the end of the day biden we already knew was going to change his approach towards nato and the quad needs to be expanded indo pacific still remains a very important matter of concern for everybody is nato a really a drama yes it is nato is an obsolete concept which is being perpetuated in relevance to what is there because the context of the nato was the cold war and it was west versus east the concept of the warsaw pact and the nato however the nato people thought would not survive after 1991 once ussr was gone however the nato has still survived because all of them have the same interest which is protect the first world and more or less if you will see they don't prevent anything they respond to things and that too they have certain degrees of response we will deliberate we will then pass something this and that the simple point of the matter is it is a totally western concept it has no relevance for india we if you had uh, uh, if you've seen the previous videos we had a very long discussion about how we should not fall the for the nato lollipop which is that we have no purpose in nato because of the concept of collective decision making and it only undercuts our interest and therefore any country which wants to protect its sovereignty will never be part of nato nato is us dominated nato is a part of the us world view unipolarity and it's a tool of what we call as neo imperialism the way imf acts the way world bank acts nato is that body which creates this false sense of security and if it was so important for the collective security of the european sector ukraine would have been made the part of it very very soon or sooner or later but still they are playing that basic drama that's a separate discussion altogether i am still trying to give you a basic overview with regards to how nato does is not a benign body it's not a benevolent body understand this point any body which is coming any institution which is coming out of the west is to protect their interest it is not to protect your interest or india's interest or collective security why are they talking about expanding quad because at the end of the day they know that the more players they add into quad the more china will become a little bit uh, what we call as scared or it will start to face this diplomatic pressure but china is china it doesn't really care so if quad was so effective then there was no need to expand it only so quad again is a us led drama because india understands that and that is why our foreign policy right now is all alignment which is we'll align with everybody russia is giving us cheap oil we'll take it so nato at the end of the day is not a very uh, what we call as a neutral body understand this point much like the un un is toothless it has no real power 
NATO is actually the real UN in that regard because all the major countries have come together to argue about something. So I've gone off track with regards to that but I hope that you understand the basic point. This understanding will come when you will read world history. When you'll actually understand the first world war, the second world war, the hypocrisy of the West and if you've been with me in the class you would understand this point that NATO is a product of Cold War politics. However, it remains as a institution which protects the interest of the West rather than protects the interest of the world. Understand this point and your innocence with regards to world history geopolitics will actually go away. Okay, with the, this we move to Prince Bite section three very small topics till this point everybody is with me first we discussed the, recently we discussed the concept of the NATO thereafter we discussed issues with tomato then NATO and tomato and then we move to the concept of nurses and we have tried to understand different concepts from GS paper 1 2 and 3 rather 2 and 3 more can we move to prelims bite yes okay now First is something which is materializing out of what we did last year. So in September of 2021, which was for formally signed by 2022, was a very important defense pact between Airbus and Space SA in Spain, which produces a very important aircraft, which is C-295. This is an aircraft which is used by the Air Force quite a lot for transportation. And under this, under this, Airbus is now going to produce which is called send certain flights through what we call as ready to ready to use and certain technology transfer is going to happen wherein the Tata group is also involved. So very simply Airbus was ready to technology transfer and produce this in India and that is that is quite significant. Why is it significant? Because in September the first C-295 under this is going to come. We have sent six pilots who are being trained. 20 members who are maintaining this basic sector, the, the maintenance of this flight, all of this is being trained right now. Further, the assembly line is, which is going to which is going to come in Vadodara is also underway under Tata Advanced Systems Limited. And by September 2026, the first aircraft will also be manufactured in India. So again, this is a very specific thing. Something which was done last to last year, materialized in the last year itself. Now we are seeing the tangible impact of it. Technology transfer for something which we have a lot of demand for is something good and a very tangible development in our defense policy. Thereafter, Black Sea Initiative. This is very important for you. Prelims examination can come at any point of time. Black Sea Initiative is something the name itself will actually not give you the answer and therefore it is important to understand it. See, under this initiative, once the Ukraine and Russia war started, what we see is that the Russians had brokered a basic agreement with the UN that though most of the ports, understand this, most of the important ports which are there in Ukraine were attacked by Russia, food, fertilizer, grain, export, was allowed from certain designated Ukrainian ports to the global market. So therefore, they said that though they are under our control, though we are and we will not attack any ship which is there for neutral purposes and which is taking food grains, fertilizers and, and what we call as basic raw material out of Ukraine. Now, the UN has brokered it. It was seen as a major initiative. But on Monday, Russia said that it will stop implementing the Black Sea Initiative and therefore the export of food and fertilizers from the Russian conflicting zones will not be allowed. Again, something which let's see how does it impact on the grassroots level. But this was seen as a major breakthrough that though there's a conflict, Russia was ready to allow any form of food, fertilizer and export out of of Ukraine that is now not going to happen. Why the Black Sea Initiative? Because at the end of the day, Crimean Peninsula, Sevastopol is the most important port in the Black Sea itself. And Russia has a full oversight over the Black Sea because of Sevastopol. And in that sense, if Russia does not allow it, it will become a problem. But for you, what is important is what is Black Sea Initiative. Now, with this, last, Passport Index. Passport Index, India has improved its ranking. It has the Henley Passport Index 2023, 80th rank, we were 87th last year. How does this indicator work? 
it is the number of countries allowed visa free access via passport so if i take for example the indian passport how many countries will allow me to enter on visa on arrival or visa free this is the concept of visa free access and the henley and partners are the ones who actually bring out this index itself now very simply japan used to be the first one but it has fallen down on this ranking singapore has become officially the first one its passport is considered the most powerful because you can visit 192 travel destinations and 227 different destinations visa free itself germany italy spain occupied the second place and thereafter japan and austria finland france luxembourg don't have to learn this but the basic point is india is 80th how is it assessed it is assessed through the concept of visa free entry and at the end of the day how powerful your passport is so before we move on to the main question let me give you a basic summary of what we've done first we discuss the concept of ubi universal basic income and universal basic income its application in rajasthan when 25 days of work over and above that 1000 rupees incrementally increasing 15% every year for anybody who cannot work 125 days guaranteed urban or rural in rajasthan politically connected or politically motivated move sure but a good application of ubi thereafter we move to the concept of nurses how there is a major skewed concept in colleges certain districts 40% of districts in india do not have a nursing college and over and above that a concentration of colleges in the south and in the west and nothing in nothing more or less in central or north india and north eastern india 2% thereafter we move to tomatoes how tomatoes are impacting or are impacted by climate change itself systemic issue is climate change inter needing to supply chain issues then we move from tomato to nato and nato summit zelensky did not get anything he just got a council for better coordination whatever that means for him and then we've discussed three basic concepts c295 production has started by september 2026 we will get it thereafter the uh, black sea initiative and last but not the least passport index india's 80th rank clear everyone perfect so let's look at the main question in the context of the rajasthan minimum guaranteed income bill 2023 discuss the concept of universal basic income a gs paper 2 and 3 both you can see this type of question thereafter the prices of tomatoes is an indicator of economic cost of climate change comment this is again gs paper 3 oriented question and i hope you will be able to answer them a lot of students ask me how do you write an answer we have started our basic preparation to just give you a very small basic tablet on this remember intro body and conclusion are the three basic parts of any answer introduction body conclusion never write it it has to be in the mental sphere you need to know this is the introduction i am writing body and conclusion mostly this can be paragraph this can be point wise this can be paragraph it gives a better aesthetic look to the answer itself totally your call that ways and introduction in a 150 word answer would be maximum 20 to 30 words this would be again 20 to 30 words the core answer always remains 100 in a 250 word answer it has to be 100 150 words very simply have to be very precise in what you write remember one thing very clearly in upsc you don't write what you know you write what the question is asking you don't have to show off to the examiner over and above that one more thing is very very important that you have to control your urge to write more because if you are actually writing more than what is prescribed it is a crime in itself and very simply please be specific please be specific because then only you can remain within the word limit itself maybe in the next session which is tomorrow i am i am the one who is going to take cna again maybe i'll give you another insight with regards to how to write an introduction but with this i would like to end the session thank you so much take care bye bye see you tomorrow